Praise be to the Lord. 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 How joyous it is to be in your presence, God. To know you, to hear from you, God. To know you tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Mm. You open your Bibles tonight to the 146th Psalm, please. Psalm 146. I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about a simple subject that I hope will have a bit of practical application that you and I can do, make changes in our lives, come closer to our God, come to know Him better. He is here tonight and I sense that. I sense the Lord's leading even now. I wish to exhort you a little bit tonight on the subject that Pastor Emery was sharing about just a moment ago as he exhorted you on praising the Lord. I want to talk to you tonight about a psalm of personal praise. A psalm of personal praise. I'd like to read in your hearing tonight the 146th psalm. The Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous, the Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. And as he began the psalm, he ended it. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. <laughs> Would you say that with me tonight? Praise ye the Lord. A psalm of personal praise, if you will. You may be seated. You may stand and be seated as you wish tonight. I feel the Lord's presence in a special way here tonight. I, I want to obey and lead or follow His leading here this evening. The last five psalms that are given to us in this collection of 150 psalms Psalm 146 through 150, all of them begin and end with the same phrase, Praise ye the Lord. And so it is so translated, Praise ye the Lord. It is made up of, it's a phrase that is made up of two Hebrew words, Halal and then Jah, which is the name of God or a name for God, uh, a name for the Lord. And it is literally, it does mean or translate it, praise you the Lord. We've taken those Hebrew words and as they have uh, come uh, forth into other, other languages, they have come to be the word hallelujah. Or as the Hebrew is halal, ja, or halal, ya. 
You can see or hear the similarity in the phrases. It is said, I have not been exposed to all languages throughout the earth. There are numerous languages and language groups. It is said that this word, hallelujah, that we say is the same in all languages, understanding that there are some variations in it in terms of how it is said or pronounced. We say hallelujah. There are some that would say alleluia without the H in Spanish. The H is silent. I've been around some folks and they pronounce it alleluia. And you can hear a very strong uh, ending on that. I suppose if you're from North Carolina, it's hallelujah. I don't know, but uh, to some, I suppose it is. But depending on where you may be, uh, will depend on exactly how that word is pronounced and how it is uh, enunciated. But nevertheless, praise you the Lord is the word hallelujah. And hallelujah, if you ever wanted to know what it means, you now know what it means. It means praise the Lord. That's exactly what hallelujah means, and that is a literal translation of the uh, words itself. And these final psalms uh, that are written for us and, and collected and arranged in this particular order, he ends and begins each of these five psalms with that word hallelujah. You notice in, in the psalm that I wish to share with you tonight is a psalm of personal praise. And he talks about how that I will praise the Lord and sing praises unto my God. Psalm 147 talks about uh, a national praise. And he, he talks about how that uh, the nation of uh, Israel should give praise and thanks unto God. He talks about Jerusalem praising Him. In Psalm 148, it's a psalm of one universal praise. He talks about praising the Lord from the heavens and then in the land. Uh, uh, verses 1 through 6 in and, and a, and a sense of a descending order. And then we, we find it in uh, verse 7, praise the Lord from the earth. And he talks about the things beneath giving him praise. In Psalm 149, it is the, a psalm of praise in the congregation of saints. And then again in Psalm 150, a general psalm of praise and telling us how that we can express that praise and the manner uh, of, of expression that is acceptable unto the Lord God. Not all praise is received by God. Not all praise is accepted by God. It has to be a particular praise in a particular fashion from a particular heart, if you will. But I, I want to I go to this Psalm 146 and just share with you some things that are on my heart tonight that I think are very important for us. We hear a lot of this word, hallelujah, in the church house. Tonight I've heard it said many times. I've heard many praise the Lord's in this uh, a time of worship that we've already had in this congregation tonight. But many times there are a lot of hallelujahs, but not a lot in between. Now what do I mean by that? There are a lot of praise the Lord, nothing wrong with that, but not a lot of that, not a lot in between. In other words, why are we praising the Lord? And how are we praising the Lord? If you're going to praise someone, you'll have to say more than I praise you, I praise you, I praise you. Well, tell me something about that person that you are praising. Tell me something that person has done. Tell me something about that person's character. Show me some good deed. Tell me some good, no, find me some uh, uh, character of nobility in Him. And many times uh, we talk and we praise the Lord and we have a lot of hallelujahs but not a lot in between. Not a lot of specifics uh, indicating why we praise the Lord or for what reason or how we are praising the Lord. The word praise itself means to boast, to glory, to brag, to exalt, to extol. It is the idea indeed of exalting someone. And you do that by talking about that person. Not merely by saying praise to that person, uh, uh, but it is the idea that you extol them by saying various things. And we're going to see some of that in this psalm tonight. And I would like for you and I to learn to fill in the blanks. I would like for our hallelujahs, I think, need to take on a greater significance so that between the hallelujahs are reasons for the hallelujah. Are indeed uh, are things that you and I are saying about our God. Because if there is ever a time, as it has been expressed tonight, when we need to boast and brag about our God. God, it is now. If there's ever a time that He needed to be extolled and exalted in a nation when He's blasphemed and ridiculed and mocked and rejected, let the church of Jesus Christ extol and exalt and praise and lift up the name of our God. It is essential in this hour in which we live. Many times our praise is simply lacking a lot. 
We can talk about this psalm and, and the, the psalms and read them and we might say a praise the Lord and a hallelujah once in a while, but most of the time our praises are relegated to the church house. Most of the time our extolling of the Lord is in the midst of the saints. There's nothing wrong with extolling God in the midst of the saints, but there needs to become a personal praise and a personal witness out there to this world that says that I want you to know about my God. I want to tell you something about my God. I want to tell you about the high and holy one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, who dwells in the high and holy place, and with him that is of a humble and contrite spirit. I want to tell you about the God that made all things. I just want to exalt my God because he is great and there is none that is greater than him. When I look at this psalm tonight, I want you to notice, please, at least three things in reference to the praise. Number one, there's a declaration of praise. In verse one, he says, praise you the Lord, or hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O my soul. This is a declaration that this man makes, the psalmist makes and says, praise the Lord, O my soul, as if he is speaking to himself, as if he is declaring even unto himself and to those around him, praise the Lord, O my soul. This is the praise that is not dependent upon circumstances because true praise is not dependent upon circumstances. Praise is an act of the will. It is a decision of the heart. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He doesn't talk about whether he's in good times or bad times, whether he's in sickness or whether he's in health. He doesn't talk about whether he's in the midst of trouble and anxiety or whether he's in the midst of peace and, and, and tranquility. No, he just says, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And that's what it needs to begin, first of all, that you and I need to make a decision that at all times you and I are going to praise the Lord. And it is going to be a decision of our will that wherever we go, there will not be a complaint that comes out of our lips. There will not be a grumbling spirit. There will not be this kind of discouragement and despair. There will not be this woe is me mentality. There will not be this God has turned me aside. Or what am I going to do out of these lips in reference to God? Will come nothing but exaltation and praise so that everybody around me will know I hold a high opinion of God. The world may not hold a high opinion of Him, but I've got a very high opinion of my God. To me, He is everything. To me, He is all. And that's not just something that I've come up with. That is a reality that is true and is true in all of the world. In verse 2, he says, While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Here he talks about not merely the declaration of praise, but a determination to praise. Here is something that he's saying. It's not just something I'm going to do now. It is something I'm going to do while there's breath in this body. While I am alive, I am going to praise Him. Those that are in the grave, praise not God. Now you may praise the Lord where you go in heaven, but when you die, understand something. In reference to this earth, your voice is silenced. Your voice does not speak from the grave. You do not say anything and nobody hears you. So you have your opportunity now. If you miss it now, you've missed it on this earth forever, my friend. Because you and I are here and we've got the opportunity. And while we live, he said, I'm alive. And as long as I'm alive and I've got breath in this body, I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to exalt Him. I'm going to extol His name. And I'm going to sing praises unto my God. I don't want that to be just religious rhetoric tonight. I would like you to ask yourself and I'd like for you to take the next few days and examine your life just how much praise comes off your lips in reference to God. Just how often are you found bragging about the Lord, particularly using the language of Scripture. And though we praise Him for things He has done for us, many times if all we do is praise Him for things He's done for us, our praise sounds a bit selfish. Because it's just praise in reference to good things that have happened to us. And one wonders if good things had not happened to you, would you be praising Him? One wonders if you were not in good circumstances, health and good finances, would you be praising Him? 
I think the real test of our praise is when we're in dire straits. I think the real test of our praise is when the world can see us, that our lives are under pressure, bad things have happened to us, difficult things have come to our life, but the only thing that comes from our lips is nothing but extolling of God. In other words, our difficult circumstances has not caused us to lower our opinion and our estimation of the Lord God. If anything, those circumstances have drawn us closer and caused us to extol Him greater and to lift him up in a greater and higher fashion. Somewhere we need to make the determination and as long as I'm on this earth, I'm going to sing praise to God Almighty and I'm going to lift up His name. And then he talks about in the remainder of this psalm the direction of that praise. And I want to share some things about that. Notice, follow with me in your Bible. First of all, he tells us where it should not go. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. Notice this, put not your trust in princes. There is a general statement here when he talks about in the Son of Man, but first there's the specific statement. Put not your trust in princes. We live in a world in where the trust of mankind has been placed in princes. Who are the princes? The princes are the governors. They are the civil rulers of the land. They were the civil rulers then. They're the civil rulers now. I'm telling Telling you that a good majority of this nation is depending and looking to the government of the United States to be the savior of this nation. And I'm telling you it's a false hope. The Bible clearly tells us that our trust and confidence should not be placed in princes. We should never ultimately have our hope in any governor, in any civil ruler, in any earthly king, because ultimately they will fail. They can give us their dreams. They can bring to us their vision. They can bring to us their plan for society and what they intend to do to change our nation. But the Bible says this. There always comes the day when their last breath is drawn. There always comes the day when their spirit returns to the earth or their body returns to this earth. And that they, all of their thoughts perish. All of their dreams die with them. Everything that they wanted to do dies and is based in that grave where they are placed. Because they cannot fulfill one vision when they in that grave. Absolutely not. You and I are exhorted that our praise is not to be directed to men. Why? Because men is not our source of help. The men of this world, the civil rulers are not our source of sustenance and our source of help. You and I are people who depend on the Lord. Amen. Too often times we look so much and how many times have, our, have we been disappointed as civil ruler after civil ruler has failed morally, failed to keep the promise, many times made promises that were impossible to keep to begin with, things that they, they said just to say them, just to win somebody's affection, and, and the crowds praised them. The crowds extolled them. The crowds lifted them and exalted them. Voted for them, placed them in office, placed their picture in their homes, placed their picture on the billboards, placed their names on the cars. The bumper stickers, the signs, wave their, uh, their, their, their uh, banners and, and their uh, uh, placards in the, in the political rallies all over. And we had our hope. Here's the man that's going to change the nation. Here's the man that's going to rescue us. Here's the one that's going to help us. He's going to bring the change that America brings. And it always turns out something different than what you had hoped for. Something different than what you expected. And that's why the psalmist has come to understand if David is the one writing it, he himself himself is a prince. He himself is a king over the nation. And he says, I am not the hope of this nation. I am not the hope of the city of Jerusalem. It is none other than God himself who is our hope. And you and I need to know that our praise is not to be directed towards earthly rulers, but towards the Lord himself. In verse 5, he tells us why. Three things he mentions. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. He mentions three things here. Number one, if I may start with the middle, he talks about God who is his help. And he particularly mentions the God of Jacob. 
First time we ever hear that, that phrase or that title given to God, it is not a title that man gave him. It's quite frankly, man has no right to give God any title. You and I have no right to place any name on the Lord that He has not placed upon Himself. I am not to reveal God. God reveals Himself. Jesus came and revealed the Father, God, revealing God. Amen? That's what we have. And I, I have no right to place any title. But the first time we hear this title used in reference to God is from the lips of God Himself in the book of Genesis when He is, uh, uh, when he is making promises, I believe, to uh, Moses, rather, right in the book of Exodus when He is making promise to Moses. And Moses hears Him out of the burning bush and He says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That's an interesting thing because it indicates that this God is a very personal God. He's a God who is willing to identify Himself with the names of men. Think about this, that God has taken unto Himself. Jacob didn't declare this. Uh, Israel didn't declare this. Uh, Isaac didn't declare it. Abraham didn't declare it. God said this about Himself. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. And I am the God of Jacob. That's a wonderful thing. That this God who is high and holy invisible sovereign over all the world. Why is He worthy of praise? I'm going to tell you one of the reasons He's worthy of praise is because He is willing to identify with the likes of us. The low life that you and I are, as low as we are, as nothing as we are, as minuscule as you and I are in this world, in this universe, our God is willing to connect His name that is high and holy with the name of a supplanter and deceiver like Jacob. I'm telling you that's my helper. My helper is somebody who comes to me and touches me where I am in my condition and lifts me up to where He is so that I can be with Him. Let Him therefore be praised because He is my God. Not only just the God of Jacob and His identity and not willingness to identify with the man, but to use that name. He didn't say, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Israel. Though He is the Holy One of Israel, and that term is given to Him, but in particularly this relation is to God of Jacob. Now when He spoke that to Moses, it had already, they were not called the Jacobites, they were called the Israelites. They were Hebrew people. And they are a people who uh, identify themselves not so much with Jacob, but with Israel. But God used the name Jacob. That was His name before God changed Him. That was His name before He wrestled with God. That was His name when He was a supplanter, given to Him a heel snatcher. Uh, one who comes and, and snatches the heel of His brother. That's literally what the name means. And, and, and that's the one that God identifies with. He said, it's that one that I took from the womb. Jacob have I loved. Esau have I hated. It is that one that God looked down and saw where He was going to take him and what He was going to do with him. God said, I'm going to identify with that man. I know he's going to cheat. I know he's going to uh, uh, manipulate. I know he's a, a, a deceiver and a supplanter. I know that's the kind of man, but I'm going to change him. I'm going to do something in his life, but I want you to know I'm his God. Hallelujah. I'm his God. God says, I am his God. I belong to him. I identify with him and you and I need to understand. I mean, the God of Daniel Woods. That's an interesting thing to me because I can say He is my God. A God of Gordon Leggett. The God of Steve Mitchell. That's a powerful thing that you and I have. How much should you and I praise and extol a God who is willing to identify with us as individuals? Show me one pagan God that would identify with a man. You will not find it. You will not find it. It's only our God who is the personal God. This is a psalm of personal praise. And somewhere you and I will never come to extol Him until we've come to meet Him and know Him personally. And that's where it begins. It begins in this heart. It begins in my relationship and my connection with Him so that as I've come to know Him and I can tell you, He is my God. He is to me my Father. He is my Lord and my Helper. And this is my help. This is the one that's with me. And oh, how I need help. I'm learning that more every day. I need help. So much help that I cannot do. I need the help of God on a constant basis. Let me praise the Lord my help because He is is indeed with me. Now notice what he said. Happy. 
First of all, he mentions this God of Jacob is his helper. And then he says, happy is he that has the God of Jacob for his help. I will tell you why there's a lack of praise. Number one, and there's a lack of praise in our lips because we do not acknowledge that God is our constant helper. If we saw that what we were doing on a daily basis would not be done if the hand of God had not been there with us. If we could come to acknowledge that, we'd be talking a lot more about what God's doing than what we're doing. We'd be talking a lot more about God and exalting Him than we would our own self when we come to understand that if you and I bear any fruit, it's because we're attached to the vine. And if you and I do any good work, it's because God's working in us. And if you and I produce anything for the Lord, it's not us that's done it, but the grace of God that labors within us. And if we could come to understand that and learn to change our language, I think if we would find ourselves extolling God more and more, God would be more inclined to work among us because here's a people who will give me the glory. God's not going to come and do mighty things among a people who are going to rob Him of the credit, rob Him of the glory, rob Him of the exaltation. No. Somewhere when the deed is said and done there needs to be a shout from the camp a praise from the people of God that says He is worthy. God be praised. We are nothing but a bare instrument in His hand and it is God who has done the work and deserves the glory and praise. And somehow that's going to have to be stated in a sincerity that doesn't sound like a self-proclaimed modesty. Most of us would not be so bold to stand up and say, look at me and look what I've done. But you can't even brag on God but do it in such a way that it's still bragging on you. You can brag on God God in such a way that when it's said and done, people don't have a higher opinion of God, they have a higher opinion of you. When the boasting is done, when the bragging is done somewhere, it's got to be done from such a heart of true humility and praise that it is very clear to the people who hear us that it is God who is being extolled and they need to walk away with a higher estimation of God rather than of us per se. And somewhere they need to walk away knowing that God be praised and look what a great God that man serves and what a great God that he belongs to. I want to know that kind of God. He says that, that's number one, but then he says, happy is this man. Are you happy tonight? Why are you happy? Would you be happy if circumstances were different? Would you be happy tonight had your day not went so well? Would you be happy tonight if you did not have the health that you presently enjoy? Would you be still happy tonight if you did not enjoy the financial security that you presently enjoy. Could God strip from you all of your things and you still be content with Him and Him alone? That's a big statement. It's a big question and I'm not so sure that any of us maybe are equipped to handle that. I don't know that it will do us any good to boast about what we would do when we've never been there. Most of the time I end up doing something different than I thought that I would do. But I would like that God would be so much. And I pray that each day that God will mean more and more and more to me. That if everything be stripped from me, that I may say with Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That I may say with those that have gone on before me, that the only source of happiness is the presence of Almighty God. May God so prune our branch. May God so prune our vineyard so that He may strip away from us the things that you and I think are essential and let us understand that those things are not indispensable. There's only one thing indispensable to life and it's God Himself. There's only one thing and one person that I cannot live without and it's God Himself. I'm not looking for something bad. I'm not asking for something bad. I'm just telling you, even when things are there, you and I can find our contentment from God and from God alone. Many times there's not much praise because there's not much happiness. We're not really happy. 
We're not contented with our life. We're not contented with our lot. We're not contented many times with our family. Many times we wished we lived somewhere else. We wish we had something else. We wish we could do other things. And we spend a lifetime wishing we were someone else, somewhere else, or could do something else. And that's a bad thing. Happy, happy are the people who the God of Jacob is their help. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo! Praise the Lord. That's what I want to be. Well, Lord, if I'm not as happy as I ought to be, then let me come to know you more. And let me understand and attribute every ounce of happiness I've got to the God whom I serve and the God of Jacob, whose son and servant that I am. That's where it's got to come tonight. That you and I have got to do that. And it may be easy now. You can hear that and say amen now. But tonight, if you're feeling good and you've had a good day, and you've got your, your body is free from pain and things are rolling fairly smoothly, then it's not so much a great test. But the test will come in the hour of your infirmity, in the hour of your sickness, in the hour of your financial strain. That's when it will come. And that's when we've got to see, will you still extol the Lord? Will you still exalt Him? Will you still praise Him? Will you still stand in the midst of the trial and say, my joy cometh from the Lord and my help cometh from Him. Him, and I am happy to know Him. When you are happy, when God helps you, it makes you happy. And it gives you hope. That's what He said. His hope is in the Lord is God. The expectation around us doesn't look very good. It was spoken tonight at the beginning of the service. Quite a dismal picture has been painted for us. I expect there are a number of positive things that are happening in this world, but they don't generally make the newspaper and they don't generally make headline news. It has been a proven fact that people are more attracted to negative news than positive news. Yeah, it's a fact. A fire will attract folks a whole lot more than an ice storm, just the way that it is. But understand it. He says here, his hope is in the Lord, is God. There's not a lot around us in which we can place our hope. Ultimately, the best of family will fail you. Ultimately, the best of friends will disappoint you. And I'll be quite frank with you, you will disappoint your own self. There'll be a lot of times that you put high hopes and high stock in your ability to do something and stay true and you'll find out you'll disappoint yourself. You will. There's not much around us to put our hope in, but I have found a place. I have found a source. And it is God Almighty. You see, when your expectation comes from Him, you will praise Him. You will fill your mouth with the praises of God and exalt Him. And I will tell you somewhere, that's where this church has got to get to. If we'll be busy praising God, we'll not have any time to fool with the negative things. So many times if we'll be busy lifting up the Lord, we won't have time to get down and in the dumps and in despair. If we'll just set our heart to praise God. And how much more we ought to do it out there. But how much more when we come together, when the Lord's presence is manifest, when we can feel His Spirit, when He manifests Himself to us, when there are tongues in interpretation, when you can feel the glory of God, and you can feel His nearness and His holy conviction, how much more should the high praises of God fill our lips, and we should exalt Him and declare Him, but many times you ask for a testimony, and it takes a pulling here, it's like trying to pull eye teeth, as the saying goes, and you're trying to pull here and there, and there's no testimony, because there's no joy, because we can't tell you anywhere God God has helped us this week. I would tell you there ought to be a sense among the people of God when a testimony is called for, they ought to jump up like fleas around here and say, I got something to tell. I got a praise. I got something to give God praise for. I want to exalt the Lord for who He is. And then he talks about it. This God. And here's where I want you to see some things. 
There's very little exaltation because we give very little thought to these things. Again, nothing wrong with our praise being connected to what God's done for us personally. That's part of it. But that's not the whole of it. And if your praise is only connected with what God's done for you, you have a narrow praise. You need to broaden your mind. Verse 6, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is. Now, I don't know about you, even though we have hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and volcanoes, and those are nothing more than the result of an earth that's under judgment and rocking and groaning and travailing because of the sin. The Bible does talk about the earth that will vomit up its inhabitants. You can hear it right now. The more this nation sins and the more sin that fills this nation the more natural disaster is going to come because the earth is going to vomit it up itself. You're not going to get away from that. It's a biblical concept. The earth groans and travails, the Bible says, and is waiting for a day of release. There's no doubt about that. But in all of that, I am telling you, I'm glad God made the world the way He made it. I would have hated to see a world designed by anybody other than God. I quite frankly would not wish to live in it. Even a world that's under the curse. Even an earth right now that is rocking and reeling. I just spent some time in the mountains of West Virginia and can drive, drove through some area, took a train ride to the, uh, uh, up, up Shaver's Fork, a place called Shaver's Fork and a place called Cheat Falls. And even an earth that has been cursed and even an earth that is filled with, with uh, thorns and thistles. I walked down to that falls and looked at the water and, and the beautiful water going over the falls. And as we rode the train looking out through the valleys and, and across the mountains and even under the curse, it's still... One of the most beautiful sights that a man can ever see. I'm going to tell you something. Here's the reason we don't praise God. It's because we've not really come to acknowledge Him as Creator and see what our God has done and going, that's not, has anything to do with me. How, when's the last time you talked to somebody or mentioned to somebody how good and great of a God we serve who has made this universe, who has made the birds, who has made the bees, who has made the animals and every insect, every thing has been made in such a wise and wonderful way. Let God be extolled and let God be exalted. Amen. When's the last time we heard of, of some new discovery in the medical realm? And they declared with the psalmist how fearfully and wonderfully we are made. No. It's look what so and so has discovered. Look what this year's research brought. You know, it's an interesting thing is, is man truly, all he can really do is discover. He really can't invent. It's in some sense a misnomer. Man can't really create. Man can only discover. <laughs> all he can take and do is learn about what God already knows. I can't invent anything new. I can't bring any new knowledge. It might be new to us because we didn't know it before, but it's really not new. It's just something that's God revealed. And somewhere there ought to be a praise that comes back if man has been able to discover some way that he can help and aid the healing process in the body. What he ought to say is not thank you and glory and praise to the pharmaceutical companies, to the research and development companies, but there ought to be a praise that it goes up to the God of heaven uh, who gives men knowledge uh, and who lights every man that comes into this world uh, because you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, it is not we who have made us, but God who has made us. We're His people and the sheep of His pasture. If we would come to grips with the fact that we are created people, we would extol our God more and more. We have a fear today. We go to the doctor. Some good thing happens. The doctor gives us a pill. Or the doctor does something. And we get better. And we're going out of there and we're afraid. Just trying to stutter out the words. Well, thank the Lord. We're not praising Him as we have to be praising Him. 
We ought not to be afraid to sit in a doctor's office in front of an atheistic pagan doctor, if that's who he is, and declare, Sir, God has made us. Isn't it a wonderful thing how God gives men knowledge and has allowed us to discover a way in which we can help in the healing processes that God's already placed in the body? It might not go over well. And your praise might be met with a refutation, a refusal, a rejection. But that's all right on their part if that's what they want to do. Let them do it. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And somewhere we've got to become a people who exalt and praise our God. We've got to acknowledge Him for who He is. He keeps truth forever. First of all, He's Creator. Second of all, He is the guardian who keeps everything together. But He keeps truth forever. Do you know that one plus one is still two? And it was two when Adam was made. Do you know that the truths, the essential truth of man and God, with all of the onslaught, with all of the antagonism, the hatred, the animosity against God, against Christianity, against Jesus Christ. The truth of God is still available today. Had it been left to Satan, had it been left to mankind, it would have long ago disappeared. The Bibles would have been burned. The truths would have been buried. And they would have been hidden and obscured from mankind. But I can tell you, man is not the supreme guardian of truth. God is the supreme guardian of truth. And I can have an assurance that in the midst of the deception where we live now, and we live in a lot of it, my friend, yet I do not have to be afraid. God will still bring truth to me. And I can live in the midst of deception and know that God is true. If I can share a portion of a testimony that my brother was sharing with me around the supper table this evening. Just a short while after he was converted, saved from a hundred dollar a day drug habit, saved from terrible sins, inquisitive, searching, after he's converted, wanting to know more and more about God. Goes to a Bible study or, or service in a home. And this particular preacher gets up and ministers and starts talking about this idea of kingdom now theology. Or this business that man's going to prepare the kingdom for Christ to return and we'll bring righteousness. And when we've got it together, Christ will come back. It was a popular theology from some time ago. Various terms that are it, it, it's still among some circles. The only thing is, the further that we go down, the more that theology looks pretty bad, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't hold too much in times like these. But he didn't know anything about that. He didn't know anything really about end times and much about the Bible hardly at all. And he could have so easily been swallowed up in that. But he said he's sitting here in the midst of that. And a voice speaks to him and tells him. Immediately he said... I even looked around. God spoke to him and said, I didn't save you for this. I didn't save you for this. He looks around. It has been clearly the voice of God. He gets up, says his goodbyes, and never goes back again. But he could have gotten duped in that stuff. But what saved him? Because there's a guardian of truth. Hallelujah. I'm telling you that if you've got a heart for truth, God will see that you get it. If you want to know the truth, you will not have to fear deception. If you truly have a heart for truth, the only way you can be seen is that you lose your love for truth. But as long as you have a love for truth and in your heart of hearts, in the very core of your being, you absolutely say and know and admit. And there it is such that you can declare, I want nothing but the truth of God. I want nothing but truth no matter what i got to do, no matter what i got to 
change, no matter what it makes me look like, no matter what it makes me to be. I want to know the truth. If that's the heart you've got, there's one that's a keeper of the truth and He will make certain that you will have the desire of your heart because God is a God who is a guardian of truth. Let us praise Him that you and I in 2011 in the midst of deception when deceivers are waxing worse and worse, you and I can say, thank God I've got the truth and I'm not living under deception. Do you know how precious it is today just to be able to know and have the truth? And then he said in verse 7, which executed the judgment for the oppressed. We praise him and extol him for his government. He executes judgment for the oppressed. He executes judgment. Oppression comes when the tyrant gains power. And uses his influence, his money, his ability in order to take advantage of others. It's taken many forms today. But every time I go to the gas pump, I could scream. Not so much because... $3.65 a gallon is seems to be unreasonable or that I don't derive a good benefit from that $3.65. That's not it. It's because of the nonsense that goes on behind it. It's because of the greed and the covetousness and the deception and the oppression of a few men who want to manipulate. And the disparity between the price of that gas and what it takes to make it. That disparity is not found. It is found at times in other products. But so often not not other products that we buy, but that one it is. And when you see the oppression, when you see how men can manipulate and how it seems that almost a few can control Our budgets and affect our budgets so much from month to month. That's when you have oppression. You have oppression when you get a lot in the hands of a few. I've been to the third world country. I've been to Mexico where 50% of the people live below poverty. Poverty in Mexico is considered... I think somewhere around $131 a month, or a week rather. And there are many people living in extreme poverty below that. Some making just a few dollars, barely, barely, barely scraping. I've been there. I've seen that. And there are other countries that are far worse off. But what you get, I see the disparity between the rich and the poor is you get a lot in the hands of a few. That's where our country's been heading. A lot in the hands of a few. The mom and pop businesses are dying. The small businessman's finding it harder and harder and harder. Oppression is increasing. But I'm glad to know that man will not be the final declarer of what takes place. Hallelujah. And that there is a God who is sovereign over all of this universe. And that someday, understand that He will rectify the matter, but He is a God who governs. And He does bring and execute judgment to the oppressed. You can say what you want to, but I'm telling you folks, you do not sow those seeds and it not come back to you. Absolutely every one of those oil barons and every one of those Arabs that are going to take advantage of people and going to lie in their pockets. You hear me understand this, that God will hear the cry of oppression. God will see the thing that is taking place. He is not letting Himself be silent. He is not sitting back and saying what will be, will be understand he will one day stick his finger into the middle of this earth and he will bring judgment and he will set the record straight how much should you and I not praise God not 
because of the present oppression, but because of the supreme judge who will set it right, hallelujah, and who knows what is really going on. And then he mentions several things. He gives food to the hungry. He's a provider. Divine providence. That's what we talk about. Divine providence. God providing. God making provision. That's what it is. It's God intervening. Providing for things here and for things there. He gives food to the hungry. All of these things we can see what God is doing. And yet in all of them as well, His heart is revealed. I may mention that momentarily, but I want you to see just some of these things. He gives food to the hungry. It is hard for us sometimes to grasp that. Because maybe never or very infrequently has anyone in this congregation today ever truly been hungry. Some more fasting will help us with that. It will help us to appreciate what we have. So that if we do not have it outside of our will, that with our will we can voluntarily abstain from our food. And it can help us to appreciate how much God has made provision on our tables. And I will tell you what's on your table is the hand of God. Praise is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about exaltation. And then he says, the Lord looses the prisoners. He opens the eyes of the blind. He raises them that are bowed down. He loves the righteous. He preserves the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow. He's a restorer. Everything that's been broken by man. He has become a slave. God liberates him. He's become blind. God illuminates him. He's become pushed down, depressed, bowed down. God raises him up. He lives righteous. He's become an outcast. Hated by the world. God loves him. He's become a stranger who is not recognized, who is separate, who is not a part of. And so God accepts him and keeps him. He's the stranger. He doesn't have the citizenship benefits. He doesn't have all of those benefits that the world can give. But God says, I'll preserve him. I'll be his keeper. That when the government and the citizenry will turn him aside, I'll take him up and I will be his keeper. He relieves. He takes up the case of the fatherless and the widow. That is, those without providers, those without authority figures in their life. God says, I'll be that authority figure in their life. And I'll lift them up. He is the restorer. Wherever sin has broken something down, wherever something has fallen apart with the hands of man, I'm telling you, God's put it straight. If there's anything that's straight in your life tonight, it's because God straightened it out. Sin made a mess out of you. Sin took you down the wrong road. Sin messed up everything you had. If you've got a family with peace, it's because God put it together. If you've got a head lifted up, it's because God has exalted you. If you're able to have health and strength, it's because God has blessed you with it. If you can see the way and you not living in darkness, it's because the light of God has shined upon your path. If you're a widow here tonight and you've lost your husband, it's because you're still here tonight giving praise to God. It's because God's become your husband and lifted you up. I'm telling you, we've got reason tonight to praise the Lord. Almighty. We're not doing it enough. Say what you will. But there is a lack of praise on our lips toward our God. If the pastor from the pulpit looks out over the congregation and people are staring at the walls and people are twiddling their thumbs and people are distracted and people are not praising God and he has to exhort you to praise God. Something's wrong in our experience. The person standing in this pulpit and looking over a congregation, to be expected from sinners, yes. To be expected from the ignorant, yes. But from the saints 
who have experienced the power and the presence of God never is it acceptable for us to have praiseless lips. It is not acceptable for us to hold our peace in the presence of a good, generous, benevolent God who is coming by and revealing His presence to us in this place. This little nothing of a congregation that most of the world doesn't even know we exist, don't even know that we're here, and yet God acknowledges us and loves us and comes by and touches us with His presence and we can stand still in that kind of a congregation and do nothing and be distracted. Something's wrong in our relationship and we need to take another look at Calvary and say, God, change me and help me to recognize what you've done and who you are. That God may be praised. Hallelujah. Yes. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. God is a restorer. The way of the wicked, He turns upside down. Woo. The way of the wicked. Not merely the wicked, but the way of the wicked. The wicked think they're walking a way that's right side up. But God's going to turn it upside down. He's a vindicator. He's a rectifier. <laughs> he sets the record straight. And He will cause things to be seen for what they truly are. You can rest assured... To be sure your sin will find you out. And nothing will go unpunished. Oh my. Hallelujah. You can understand and know this. That every secret thing will be revealed. And every hidden thing will be made known. That there will come a day. But many times even in this life. We have found out the way God will rectify things. Oh there have been many uh, uh, agnostic that have, have stood. And they have, they have said this and, and, and that about God. And, and denied this about the Bible. And that about the Word of God. But after a while it always proves out. That they were ignorant and stupid and foolish. In the 1960s we had a theology that was taken this country called the God is dead theology and many people were going around declaring themselves to be Christian atheists I suppose and they were uh, declaring that God is dead and we've arrived at this point that we truly understand that God really doesn't exist God is dead and man has now arrived and, and we're going to do things and we're going to improve things and I can tell you right now our world since the 60s has been turned upside down and we're in worse shape now than we were in 19 50, my friend. We've been turned the wrong way. Oh, God's going to set the way upside down and reveal it for what it ever is. When they put it up, God's going to put it down. When they lift it up, God's going to shove it in the dirt because that's the kind of God that He is. Oh, I'm not going to go around and just say, oh, well, sorry for them. I'm telling you, when God sets it straight, I'm going to go out there and praise to God and say, hallelujah, 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 that God reveals the truth. The Lord shall reign. He's sovereign. We, I don't know what term we should go by. Free will. I'm not quite Armenian. I'm more Finian. After Charles Finney and his, who became one of the first ones to express the theology that I believe in in reference to sovereignty, the free will of man, and, and man in relation to sin, and whether or not he is or isn't born that way. But whatever you may call it by, Arminian, Finian, free will, what, whatever you may call it by, we have let the once in grace people, once in grace, always in grace. We have let those of what is known as the eternal security mindset rob us of the blessing of the sovereignty of God. 
And we have come where we just so want to emphasize the free will of man, the free will of man, the free will of man, that we don't want to talk much about the sovereignty of God because that leads men to think that they can live any old way that they want to live. I'm going to tell you something. The sovereignty of God doesn't have anything to do with you just living any old way that you want to live. The sovereignty of God gives me an assurance that even in a world where God has given men free will, God can still control and God can still do things. I'm telling you, when I look back at history, I don't see man in control at all. I see God in control. I tell you, there was a time that, that man thought he was in control. He was doing this. He was sending everybody back to their hometown so he could take a census and tax them. And I just find God bringing to pass a, 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 a thousand or more year old prophecy that's saying, out of Bethlehem shall come a ruler. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. And you can say what you want to wherever America is now. We may think it is just man doing this and man doing that. But I'm telling you there's a sovereign God who's got it all together. And I found out that even with my free will, I need a God who can direct me even as I make my choices. I need a God who can lead me in the right way and bring it to pass. We've lost that perspective of God's sovereignty so we don't praise Him. I'll praise Him for His sovereignty. I'll praise Him because He did it in spite of what man did. He gave man a free will and God still succeeded. (laughs) And I conclude, He reigns forever. His reign is not temporal. There's a continuity to this thing. You know why we ought to praise God? Because the God that you're with tonight is the same God that was with Enoch. It's the very same God that was with Noah. Very same God that spoke with Moses face to face. The very same God that walked with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fourth man in the fire. The very same God that shut the lion's mouth. The very same God that blew his breath and opened up the waters of the Red Sea. The very same God that spoke from Mount Sinai and said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The very same God that spoke unto Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea and Daniel and Ezekiel is the very same God that is here tonight. The very same Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost is in this very house tonight, hallelujah. And the very same Jesus that walked the shores of Galilee is the very same Jesus that you and I know tonight. We ought to give praise because He reigns forever and ever and ever and ever and He will never change. Glory to God. What security, what the blessing for my posterity, for my children, that I can rest assured that if the Lord would tarry another 200 years, my great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren could experience the same Pentecost, preach the same message, live the same way, practice the same holiness, and know it just like I know it today, because God is the Lord, and it changes not. You ought to praise Him, because He still loves you today. Hallelujah. I'm going to close. I got to close here, I know. But can I just emphasize one more thing at the end of verse 8? The Lord loveth the righteous. Maybe you said those things. A lot of times I have. I've quoted scripture and stated scripture and when it didn't really have the impact on me that it maybe needed to have. I'm going to tell you something. I've come to appreciate this. Romans chapter 8 when Paul said, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. And you hear me something right now tonight. We're a brotherhood and we were exhorted tonight and rightfully so. We are a brotherhood and we've got to encourage one another and we've got to hold up for one another. But ultimately there comes a time When your brother's not there. Ultimately, there comes a time when brothers disappoint us. Even when they try their best. We sometimes misunderstand and we are disappointed. There have been some times I felt so alone. Even sometimes my wife didn't understand me. 
My children didn't have any idea of the conflict that I was in. But I'm going to tell you something right now. There's an assurance that comes to the saint. And we're getting more and more of it. This world's pushing us aside. It's casting us out. We're, we look like we're a bunch of crazies that have lost our marbles somewhere in the midst of that. When you feel and you can think, and I'm going to tell you, we need to be loved. Now you can say whatever you want to. We need to be loved. That's a need in our life. I need acceptance. I am unable to live this life alone. That's an impossibility. Any man who comes to that kind of loneliness will end up suicidal and go into despair. Man was not meant to be alone. He was not meant to be that way. I mean, I'm not talking about a husband and wife either. I'm telling you, God didn't create us to leave us alone. He didn't create us to put us down here and let us just go on and handle it. We are not able to handle life as it comes I need to be loved. I need to know that I'm accepted somewhere. I need to know that somebody's got me in their mind. Somebody does care about me. And when I don't feel it coming from any other direction, I've been able to look up and feel a love that comes from the Father and know that He does love me. And that if I know I've pleased Him, then I've found the security that no man can give. I'm not putting down anybody else. I'm just telling you, that time comes when you must know that God alone is your caretaker. And God alone is your provider. If you've never been there, you've not had much trial. You've never been there, you've not been through much struggles. And you've got a ways to go. And we've got a church sometimes that despairs. We ought to be able to love our brothers. Not because they love us, but because God loves us. Because I've got to love you and you've got to love me when I'm not lovable. And I'm going to be frank with you, I'm not always going to be lovable. (laughs) You didn't have to amen that. (laughs) That's all right, though. Fact is the fact. And you're not always going to be lovable. There's going to be times. Doesn't mean you're bad. Doesn't mean you're evil. Doesn't mean you're not right. It just means that sometimes you're just not worthy of affection. <laughs> it just sometimes you're not an attraction. And I just don't feel that love towards you. But I know one thing, that because God loves me, I can love somebody else. Hallelujah. And you can love me when Brother Woods is not lovable. And when Brother Woods is maybe not worthy of your affection. If you reach up and know that God loves you, then you're going to be able to reach out and love somebody else who's not lovable. And that's where we are and that's why we ought to praise God because we're sitting in this place in 2011 and we've got more than we deserve we've got more than we're worthy of in this place and God's been good to us and we ought to take this psalm and put it in our hearts and say I'm going to praise Him I'm going to praise Him I'm going to shout hallelujah to this world would you stand to your feet tonight glory to the Lamb of God Hallelujah means praise the Lord. Would you just say a hallelujah tonight? Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. How many have been helped? How many can say I once was lost, but now I'm found? How many can say I'm glad I live in the truth? How many can say I'm glad God loves me? When nobody else loves me, God loves me. Hallelujah. How many can say that when my head was down, He picked it up because He's the lifter up of my head? You and I need to learn that. We need to acknowledge that. And it needs to fill our praise somewhere. We need the sandwich to grow when the hallelujahs are the two buns. We need some meat in the middle and let this world know there's a reason why we praise God. There's a specific behind the general and it is God has done this for me. I get so excited sometimes. I think about old time camp meetings. And I think about the same God that gave it then is the same God that I've got now. That gives me hope. That gives me hope. I praise Him because He's the same. 
I've grown in my knowledge of the Lord. I've come to know Him better. But the more I have come to know Him, I can tell you the God that I come to know some 37 years ago is the same God that I know today. Glory to the Lamb of God. Have you got anything? Can you see anything around you that you can begin to acknowledge your praise to your God and how you ought to praise Him? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you just take a minute and give Him thanks? Praise Him. Talk about Him. Give the specific details of what God has done. Oh, God. Oh, God, you are holy and I thank you. You are holy. I praise you because you're the just judge over all the earth. I praise you because you set up kings and put them down. I praise you because you, Lord, are the one who makes nations to rise and makes nations to fall. I praise you because, Lord, the end of time and the events of time are at your discretion. They're in your hands and not the whims of men. I praise you tonight, God, because you're unchanging. You, Lord, are not being perfected. You are a triune God and has always existed as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I thank you, God, that you, Lord, are independent of everything in this world. You need nothing. You need no one. You are the sovereign God who is self-existent and dependent on nothing outside yourself. Hallelujah. I praise you because you're my bread. I praise you because you're the resurrection and the life. I praise you because you're the light of the world. I praise you because you're Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I praise you, God. I praise you, God. Oh, I want, Lord, the high praises to fill my lips. I want to think more about you. I want to dwell more on your creative ability. You made me. You designed me. Thank you, God, for how my feet work. Thank you, God, for how you've designed this body. That even though it has experienced sin, it is able, Lord, to oftentimes experience healing within its own self. I thank you for that, God, and I praise you. Hallelujah. I praise you for the Lord. Oh, God, how many times you've healed. For the prophecies in this church. For the leadership in this church. For the pastors, I praise you. For the families, I give you thanks and praise you. God, you have put us where we are. It's not been the hand of men. It's been your hand. And we acknowledge it, God. And we exalt you. We exalt you tonight. I want you to help me to talk about you in such a way that men will leave with a higher estimation of you. Oh, I want you to help me to talk about you and preach about you in such a way that men will get excited about the God that you serve. God, that we will see who you are and what you have done and what you're going to do. The promises that you've given unto us. How your hand has saved humanity throughout history. Lord, when man in his free will would have driven it, Lord, to the grave, you rescued it. You rescued it, God. And yet never, never, never did you ever violate a man's will in doing that, God. Never did you assert a man's free will, Lord. No, 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 God. Oh, he was still allowed to make his choices. But you brought consequences for those choices, Lord. And you still brought about what you designed to bring about. And you operated your sovereign will, your free will with complete liberty, Lord. You are not limited by me. You are not limited 
in God by something I say or do. You can accomplish and build your church independent of Dan Woods. I just thank you, Lord God, for letting me be a part of it. And that's all I ask. If I can be a part of the church of Jesus Christ and glorify your name. God, help us to be and learn how to praise you, how to boast about you, how to talk about you in such a way that, Lord, you will be extolled and exalted. And though this world may reject us, they will at least understand, God, that we hold a high opinion of you. And Lord, do we hold you in high estimation and regard and reverence because you are the God of this earth. Hallelujah. You are the God of all creation. And everything is upheld and sustained by your power. By the word of your power. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs>